Church family, I'm so glad that we can join together in God's Word. I'd like to share with you a message from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might or His mighty power. There are three facts here about your life. Three facts about you in the context of spiritual struggles, conflicts, or spiritual warfare. I'm excited to share these facts with you in the title, A Walk That Truly Wins. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the privilege to be in your word. Lord, teach us. Help our hearts to grow so that we are truly walking as you desire, even in a world where there is so much conflict. Father, help us to be people who are convinced that through you, we're overcomers. Father, guide this time. May it be your words and not the words of man. We pray this in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. In July of 2018, I'm seated in my home. It was a very quiet morning. It was early in the morning. And it was a very peaceful moment of study and prayer, very typical to any Sunday morning that I wake up early and prepare for the day. So I'm sitting there in in quietness that was almost deafening, just really enjoying the moment. And and on our little dead-end street, there's no traffic. It's just a very nice, safe neighborhood with limited access in and out of, of our little street. And I'm sitting there in this quietness that has enveloped me, and I hear tires squealing. And I'm thinking to myself, not on our street. And then almost within a second, the tire squealing turned to a crash. I mean, a loud, deafening crash. And then the utility light just outside of our kitchen window went totally black. Well, obviously, I jumped up, not knowing what was happening, and I did what anyone, I guess, would do. I ran to the door to open to see what was happening, and I could smell the burnt rubber of the car tires. I could even smell the engine overheating as I saw this crumpled vehicle crashed into a pole just outside of our quiet little home. And as I began to investigate, I saw the silhouette of a person, and I heard this uh, very disturbing announcement being yelled in the opposite direction, Stop right there. It's the Virginia Beach City Police. And I thought, I need to go back inside. So I ran inside, called 911. The operator said, what street do you live on? And I told her my address, and she said, sir, you need to stay inside. There is an auto theft and a police chase underway. And I said, well, yeah, I know that. It's right outside my, my kitchen window. I'm sitting there inside my home, and it's quiet and peaceful. And just outside, outside my window, there's all this chaos taking place. If you can appreciate the abruptness of that contrast from peacefulness on the inside of the home to unbelievable chaos just outside, then you can appreciate the Bible passage that is open in front of us. At the end of Ephesians chapter 5 and the beginning of Ephesians 6, the, the speaker or the writer, I should say, the Apostle Paul, gave a beautiful God-inspired description of the home. Inside the home, there are these ideal relationships where the Christian husband is is effectively leading the Christian wife and believers as parents are lovingly nurturing their children. And you see this incredible ideal situation. But as Paul describes this and concludes that conversation, immediately in chapter 6, verse 10, Paul then says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Well, that word finally indicates that Paul is about to give one last message to the Ephesian church. It's as if Paul reaches back inside the home, that place of of ideal peace, and calls everyone to the window to say, finally, look outside. Just outside the comfort of your own life, there is a world in chaos. There is spiritual warfare going on. And you need to learn how to face that every single day. So this morning, we're being taught from God's Word how to have a walk that's not only successful inside of our own personal lives or even inside the home, but a walk that is successful in a dark and broken world. How can we have a walk that truly wins? Well, there are facts here that reveal to us That even amid the chaos and the spiritual conflict and battle and warfare that goes on around us, there are three clear facts 
that prove we can have a walk that, that wins. And I'd like to share these facts with you. First, your source of strength. Second, your stand. And then third, your spiritual advantage over the enemy. So let's begin with your source of strength. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, makes this great announcement. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, or in his mighty power. That phrase, be strong in the Lord, can represent uh, an expression that, that is continual action according to the tense of the original word. So you could actually read this statement as continue being strong in the Lord. If we dig a little deeper, that phrase, be strong in the Lord, is actually in a middle or passive voice, which actually means that you're not really the one that has the strength, but you're receiving the strength. So you could actually read verse 10 this way, and it would be very accurate with the original text. Continue on being strengthened in the Lord. That's great advice when you and I face uh, so many dark things in the world and so many evil and sinister things that are happening around us, we need to be strong, not in our own resources, but in the Lord. So how can we be strong in the Lord? Well, let me give you three responses to that question. First, your position in Christ. Second, the very power of God in you. And then third, the, the provisions that the first two brings to us. So your position in Christ. Notice that verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord. Well, the Lord here represents not only God's sovereignty, but the lordship of Christ over our lives. And we're told to be strong in the Lord. Now, now that phrase, in the Lord, or either its strict equivalent, is used some 35 times in Ephesians. Uh, this phrase represents the incredible union and fellowship we we have with Christ, if we're to be strong, if, if our lives are to be strengthened for spiritual conflict and battle, th then we need to really consider our, our union and our fellowship with, with Jesus. Be strong in the Lord. I remember what Jesus said in, in John chapter 15, verse 9, as the Father loves me, so I love you. A abide in my love. Well, that phrase, in my love, represents this spiritual union. Uh, Paul said in another part of his writings, uh, if, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Here again is that special relationship in Christ. So our position in Christ allows us to, to, to be open to the power and the strength that God wants to pour, pour into us. So first, how do we continue being strengthened? Well, we need to to stay in fellowship with Jesus, we need to consider our position in Christ on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Secondly, we need to truly receive and, and have our hearts open to the power of God. When we understand that God's power is made available to us, dear church member, dear friend, dear fellow believer, this is a literal statement. statement. This is a literal truth of, of our Christian faith. God's power resides in us. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The word mighty represents the nature of God. You remember the incredible passage in Isaiah uh, where, where we, we hear those words describing the coming Emmanuel. He's our mighty God. Jesus revealed every aspect of God to us, and a part of God's full nature is his might. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The word might represents his character. And then the term power represents the expression of his character, or you might say the activity of his character. So God is mighty, and his mightiness in action is power. Now, I love how Jesus said in John 14, verse 26, uh, I will leave my Holy Spirit with you. I will send you the Holy Spirit in my name. Now, why is that significant? for the discussion of God's power in us. Because in Romans 8, 11, we are told that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, do you know the rest of this? Lives in you. The very power of God through the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. So be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. How can we continue being strengthened? Our position in Christ. And then second, our, our total openness to God's power in us. But finally, how can we be daily or continually strengthened in the Lord? By the provisions that that power brings. Now listen again to the word of God. Uh, be strong in the Lord and, and in his mighty power. 
Now that's verse 10. Now listen to verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Put on the full armor of God. Our position in Christ, be strong in the Lord. Our openness to the power of God in us, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then the provisions that the first two bring, put on the whole armor of God. Oftentimes we read the phrase armor of God and our minds quickly move to the idea that God gives us a particular spiritual unseen armor to wear. Well, that's, that's true, but it's not true entirely because the, the idea of armor not only represents the armor God gives us, but also represents the armor that God is. When we put on the armor of God, we're just not putting on some abstract unseen thought of protection. We're putting on God. God's armor represents him. And this is an incredible truth. In, in Isaiah 59, verse 17, God himself is described as having his own breastplate of righteousness and his own helmet of salvation. So the armor of God represents how God protects us and arms us both offensively and defensively for spiritual conflict and battle. But the armor is not just an abstract idea. The armor represents God himself. He is our helmet. He's our breastplate. He's our armor and our shield and, and the protection over our feet. God defines our armoring and our, and our protection. So, oh, we have provisions because uh, we are positioned in Christ and we have God's power. And so the provisions that come are his armor that protects us and, and reigns over us. And, and we are told to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might so that we can be fully armored. Why is this so important? Well, let's go to the second fact. The first fact was indeed our source of strength. Continually be strengthened by your position in Christ, the power of God in you and the provisions of his armor. But the second fact is this, your stand. Notice the uh, incredible uh, emphasis at the end of verse 11. You put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Verse 12, because our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, powers, and world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Verse 13, so take up the full armor of God so that you can resist the evil in the day that it comes upon you. So now this second fact, the stand, represents something so significant for how you and I are to walk as winners against the dark conflicts in this world. When you read that you're able to stand, the word is actually standing firm. And this designates three experiences, our strength, our stability, and our success. When Paul's original readers heard him give this incredible challenge, you need to be standing firm. They, they heard what resonated to them in their ears and in their hearts was strength, stability, and success. God, God is saying through his, his messenger, Paul, both to the first century church and to you and, and me, be strong in the Lord. Trust God's armament over you so that you can stand firm, so that, so that you can be strong, have strength that is not of yours, so that you can have stability, not easily knocked over, and so that you can have success. Please understand, God's description of his own armor over us is not for you to put on in desperation so that you might come ahead of the enemy. The promise is, in this phrase, stand firm, that you will walk as a winner. You will succeed. You, you'll overcome the enemy who is already defeated. But, but he is an enemy. And we need to really clue in on this for, for just a moment. We are to stand firm against the enemy. So the second fact, stand postures us under God's protection and power against a real enemy. Now, I do not want to talk more about the enemy than the strength of God, but we do need to recognize how descript the presence of the enemy is in this passage and in all of Scripture. I discovered not long ago that 40% of the millennial generation, 40% believe that the devil is not real, but just a symbol of, of evil. This should really... Uh, awaken our hearts because the enemy describes uh, Satan as, as very real and a, and a foe, an enemy that seems formidable, but, but he's really defeated. He's, he's, he's not 
unlimited in his power. He has supernatural influence, but he's very limited. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. Uh, he's, he, he's, he's, he's not omnipowerful. He, he's, he's limited. But, but again, he is still an enemy. If, if you assume that the idea of the devil in the Bible is just a figure of, of evil, then I fear that you will relax. And, and then your desire for, for being armored in God's uh, protection and presence will, will have less emphasis. No, the Bible describes the devil as a real enemy coming against uh, the people of faith. Now, now follow this uh, for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 the devil is first named in that gospel and he is named the devil which means slanderer one of the attacks that the enemy satan brings against us is to slander in fact in, in revelation 12 10 uh, the devil is called the accuser of of the brethren of people who are following jesus he he wants to bring guilt and shame against those who have claimed and have professed their faith in Jesus Christ. So he's a slanderer. He's, he's the accuser. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, the devil is called an angel of light. Do you, do you know why? He would really like to appear in your life as something that is harmless, maybe even something that's attractive. More people desire light than darkness, and Satan would never present himself as an evil, dark, sinister character, but according to the Bible, as an as an angel of, of light, because he wants to deceive. He wants to make you think that what is bad is really good. He wants to make you think that what God calls wrong is really right. He's been doing this from the beginning. Just ask Adam and Eve in the opening story of the Bible. Uh, Satan is a formidable, or seemingly a formidable foe against those whose faith are in, in Jesus Christ. But there are those in the world who unwittingly so make Satan their God by resisting the love of God and following uh, his way. And, and in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, we are told that the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who will, who will not believe. And so Satan is called the God of this world, meaning he, he tries to entice hearts to follow him without revealing who he truly is. This is a dangerous enemy, yet one that you have victory over. In, the, in, in Romans chapter 6, God has said, and, and the peace of God will, will crush Satan under your feet. This is an amazing promise, yet he's still an enemy, and, and we must consider that he's posited, he's positioned himself against you and me if our faith is in Jesus Christ. Satan desires to influence, and the Bible gives us proof that he can influence us. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10 through 11, Paul recognized that sometimes Satan can influence us to have an unforgiving spirit. Isn't that discouraging? Isn't that, isn't that bothersome? That when we hold a grudge, we might well be playing out the very thing Satan wants us to do. And, and that's exactly the case. He will influence, influence us. His influence, again, is limited. But the scripture indicates that he can influence us. In 1 Corinthians 7, 5, uh, Paul describes Satan's uh, influence in this way. Uh, stay alert and be careful because uh, lest you be pulled away by the Satan because of your lack of self-control. Paul is, is giving an indication that Satan likes to attack us in our most vulnerable places. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Paul said it was Satan that hindered. So uh, the enemy, Satan, has a way of influencing us, but again, he's... He's defeated. We, we overcome him. Our stand is firmly against him because we have the right armament. We have the right protection. We have the white, what right weaponry around us because God has, has done that through Christ. So your, your source of strength, be strong in the Lord and in God's mighty power. Your stand, take on the whole armor so that you can stand against the enemy and his schemes. And, and trust me, actually trust the word of God. He's scheming to trip us. He's scheming to even distract you in your home right now so that you'll not hear the reality of his attacks. But oh, he's, he's so limited because we are so well prepared. We're perfectly prepared with God's armor. So now our attention turns to the final fact, our spiritual advantage over the enemy. We've looked at our own personal source of strength. And then second, we've looked at our stand with the armor on against the enemy. But third, uh, the final fact is, is this, our spiritual advantage 
against the enemy. Uh, the year was 2004, and then Defense Secretary of the United States, Donald Rumsfeld, went to a camp in Kuwait to encourage the troops with a pep talk. During his talk, uh, a, a strategist in one of the uh, teams uh, in, in the Army spoke up and began questioning why some of their equipment uh, was, was not up to date and, and, was, and was failing them. So the defense secretary, obviously blindsided by this, began to strategically try to discern how do we prepare better weaponry. And I'm glad that that, that was the case, that they did prepare for, for better uh, armor and weaponry. But, you know, in, in spiritual warfare, when our trust is in God and our faith is in him, we do not have to worry about being ill-equipped. We have the perfect armor. It's God himself. Uh, surrounding us through the Spirit of Christ, making us strong against the evil attacks that can come in this dark world. So I'd like to share with you this armor. You've heard this many, many times, but let's walk through these final verses of, of Paul's letter to the Ephesian church to understand the armor of God through the, through the perspective of our spiritual advantage. I say to every follower of Christ, you have an amazing spiritual advantage. In fact, you have the advantage over the enemy if you're wearing God's armor. Now, if you wear your own or if you go without, oh, we, we become so vulnerable. But oh, in God's armor, we have the advantage over our enemy. So we pick up in verse 14. Stand firm, therefore, summarizing everything that we've just said. And gird yourself with a belt of truth. Now, in, in Paul's writings, the word truth can actually mean the gospel truth or the truth of right behavior. Both are in, in indicated here. Paul is saying, as a belt that seems to hold all things together, remember that in your life, you're identified with the truth of the gospel, and you're identified with a life that lives out that truth, right behavior in response to what Jesus has done in your life. That becomes the belt of truth that holds all things together in your uh, weaponry. Let's continue reading. And then you put on the breastplate of righteousness. Ah, oh, this, this breastplate, this metal shield over the, the essential organs of the body uh, is represented here in God's armor as his righteousness lived out in us. God's character on display through the Holy Spirit in our lives, so when the enemy comes and, and tries to bring up past failures and, and bring guilt and shame into your life, you have on the breastplate of God's righteousness, and it's his character that defends you against such useless attacks. But you and I may be surprised at how many believers in Jesus fall to that attack because they don't understand the armor that is made available to them. So, so we have the belt of truth, the gospel truth that identifies who we are. We have the breastplate of righteousness, God's character over us. Uh, let's keep reading. And then we shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel. This simply means that we, we ready our feet. Our feet are quick and ready to respond. And so scripture teaches how beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those that bring the good news and proclaim peace. And so we are prepared with our spiritual shoes, if you will, which can be identified here as God's peace. Now, oh, Ephesians is a letter of peace, is it not? My mind goes back to chapter 2. We looked at this several weeks ago. Verse 14, he is our peace. He has broken down the dividing wall and made us all one new man. What a beautiful image of peace. And the armor of God represents our, our feet being prepared to move quickly. The, the shoes represent that movement into battle, and, and we, are, we are shotted, we're prepared, we're made ready with the peace of God that represents God with us. If you, if you would like to know a, a very simple definition of peace, it's God with us, no, not necessarily the absence of conflict, because this is readying us for conflict in the world, spiritual conflict and battle. But when we're shotted, when our feet are prepared with peace, we go forward in the peace we have with God and the enemy can't defeat us. What a beautiful picture the armor of God is. We keep reading. And in addition to this, taking up the shield of faith and Roman armament, which was in part the influence of the idea of armor here, but the, the greater influence, I believe, was God's character as referenced in, in Isaiah uh, chapter 59 and other chapters. But here the shield of faith is somewhat of a depiction of the shields that were used in Roman armament of Paul's day. And this shield was likely uh, uh, maybe four feet high, maybe, maybe two feet wide, uh, encased in thick leather with metal tips on each end, but soaked in water for, for much battle. And the reason is because when the enemy would use their, 
their, uh, their, their most uh, dangerous weaponry, a, a flaming arrow, uh, that, that arrow would hit the shield and would become extinguished. Well, the Bible here in our spiritual armor uh, equates that shield with our faith. Now, the word faith here, and please follow this, doesn't mean trust, but actually means our whole identity as children of, of God, as followers of Jesus, as people of faith. So your identity as a person of faith is that shield that is held up, and it's your faith in Christ, the object of your faith, that becomes that shield of protection. Do, do you see what you have so far? Look at the protection. Look at God's armor, but let's, let's keep reading. Not only the shield of faith, but then, verse 17, we take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Now, the helmet, in, in, in total, represents the ultimate of protection, the ultimate of, of protection. And so your salvation, the very transformation that God has done in you through Christ, your salvation is that ultimate protection. Uh, someone may say, uh, Pastor Ken, how do I know that, that I have ultimate victory over Satan and the enemy? Your salvation. Your salvation was secure on the cross. Nothing in you or your activity secured your salvation. You may say, well, I, I place my faith in Christ. Yes, in response to the cross. The cross guaranteed your victory over Jesus. You placed your faith in that victory. And oh, your salvation is the ultimate protection, helmet of salvation. And then finally, Paul rounds out the, the armament with uh, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Now, the word here is from the Greek rhema, which means specifically the gospel. The whole canon of the Bible was obviously not complete when Paul proclaimed this truth and when this truth was circulated among the church. But the, 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 the term word references rhema, which, which indicates the specific proclamation here of the gospel. Do you remember how we began the belt of truth, the gospel? We now conclude with the same emphasis. The word is not only, the gospel is not only that protection that holds all things together in place, but the gospel is our offensive weapon. It's the sword. Here the word for sword is actually uh, indicative in, in Roman life of a small knife that was actually pulled out quickly for offensive attack. And so we take the gospel before us to defeat any element that the enemy would bring. And there is one more piece to the armament before we conclude this morning, and that is prayer. I love how verse 18 seems to bring this beautiful golden thread around all the armor holding us together under God's sovereign protection. And verse 18 says, with all prayer, how do we pray, especially in spiritual warfare and conflict? Well, it's listed here. Pray in the spirit, meaning God guides your prayer. Uh, so many people say, Pastor, I want to pray, but I don't know what to pray. Just open your heart. Prayer is a love conversation of worship with your heavenly Father. And in the name of Jesus, we can come to him and he hears our prayers. So we must pray in the Spirit, guided by God's very presence in us. And we must pray constantly. Pray all the time. Someone once said, Pastor Ken, what, what do you pray for? Uh, they were trying to get at what might be too small for prayer. And my answer is always, I pray over everything. Pray at all times. Pray unceasingly. And then finally, what does spiritual warfare pray and look like? In the spirit at all times, being alert. Now, I love this. Uh, being alert. What an, what an incredible way to pray in spiritual warfare. Constantly being alert. Fifth century theologian Theodoret made this statement once. He or she who is constantly under battle will constantly and always pray with extreme alertness. Oh, may we pray, ever watchful, of any attempt of the enemy to come against us so that we can walk forward with, with success because that's, that's the message here. How can you walk as a winner? Not in the terms of man. Man is too reliant upon what he thinks he can accomplish. Uh, there is no self-reliance being preached here. There is, there is no element of, of man's ingenuity being proclaimed. This is the humble servant of God described in Ephesians 6, bowing before God saying, I need your armor so that I can defeat the enemy. What a beautiful picture it is for you and I to realize we walk as winners. This morning, walk as a winner. You, you have your source of strength. You have the stand that you take against the enemy. And you have the spiritual advantage because of these pieces of the armor that make you a winner. Not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. God is your armor over you. Walk forward as one who is winning over the enemy because of God 
your protection, your provider, your warrior. And he is over you because of your faith in Jesus Christ. God is before us. Christ leads us. The Spirit is within us. And we can certainly walk as a winner. Let's pray. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts in your word. Help us as we continue to minister and to live in this uncertain time. Father, help us to truly know your success in spiritual conflict as we walk our faith out every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And together we said, 